Hey, turn in your Bibles with me tonight for a few minutes. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, just remind you of our key verse that we've been going through in our series on Sunday mornings called So Loved from Ephesians 3. But if you all would turn to, to James 5, or you can turn to both if you want to, uh, and, and you're quick enough in the Word there. And I uh, want to talk about this picture that James paints for us of uh, the love that we've been talking about from Ephesians uh, 3. Paul's prayer that we would know or grasp, everybody say grasp, that he prayed that we'd get it, we'd grasp it, we'd get a hold of it. And, uh, you know, it's like if somebody had uh, something valuable to give to you or w- could present to you something tonight that you really wanted, needed, uh, either just to bless you or to really meet a need in your life, it would be one thing for them to offer that to you. It would be another thing for you to, to reach out and take it, to, to grasp it, to get a hold of it, uh, and not drop it. And so God offers us this awesome gift, but uh, um, I think a lot of times we don't catch it. We don't grasp it. We don't get it. And Paul realized that, and so he, he prayed that God would strengthen us by His Spirit in our inner being so that we could grasp it so that we could get it, give us strength to get it. And, and the, the it is God's love. And he said, I pray that you together with all the saints would have power to grasp, say grasp again, to catch it, to get it in your inner being. Everybody say it with me. How wide and long and high and deep is the love of God. And then he said, even beyond those dimensions, that I pray that you would be able to grasp that which surpasses knowledge. And as God works in us, then the fulfillment of that prayer uh, is in verse 20, that God is able to do immeasurably, immeasurably more than all that we can ask or think according to His power, His power that is at work within us. And so, with, with that in mind, with that concept tonight, we're going to see this beautiful picture from James's letter to the church. Uh, James was a great pastor, uh, Jesus' half-brother, and we spent uh, several weeks earlier, uh, toward the end of last year, going through a whole series on James. And this is kind of the culmination of that, but th- the section we're going to look at tonight from James chapter 5 just uh, six or seven verses that where he finishes out is what I think is an incredible picture, an example of what that wide, long, high, deep love of God looks like when, when it's manifest among a group of people that are gathered in God's name. A, a church, a community, uh, a house of healing, if you will. And, and how that happens. And he defines different aspects of that for us. So flip over to James chapter 5, and, and we'll talk about uh, here this, this picture, and then we'll uh, put some of those principles into practice here as we pray for one another again, uh, and spend a, a time doing that here in, in just a few minutes. Let's look at this for just a couple minutes here in, in uh, James chapter 5, beginning in verse uh, 13. He says, I think I can see this here. Um, Is any of you in trouble? He should pray. Right now, before we we go through that, let me kind of get your uh, those of you that that had teachers like I did in school. How many of you had to put your thinking caps on? Okay, so not your thinking cap, but I want you to put your image cap on. I want you to get a picture of this in your mind. And when we do, obviously, keep in mind Ephesians three, and and see how these connect. How, where's, where's the wide love? Is any of you in trouble? That's a pretty wide spectrum, wouldn't you say? There's lots of trouble we can get in, uh, and there's lots of us to get in trouble. And so it's this wide expression of it. And so as we go down through this, I want you to be thinking in those terms and ask God to, to help you see, is that a wide love? Is that a long love? Is that the depths of God's love? Is it, is it the high love that God wants to bring us into? And they're not different kinds of love. It's all obviously love from the heart of God that's overwhelming and incredible. 
love that saves us, love that heals us, uh, love that sets us free and delivers us from trouble. Uh, and as we see that, I want you to kind of connect it back to that and, and let God paint a picture, uh, not just in your mind, but in your heart and your spirit tonight. Because when we have a picture of that and we see what it can be, then I believe it's what God's calling us to, to create a culture of that, an atmosphere of that right here at the River of Life. And, and to minister in that, walk in that, in different expressions. And, and there's all kinds of them. But when, when we participate in that and not just make ministry a professional thing of, oh man, we need to take these people to the pastor to pray for them. And that's fine. I love to pray for people. But, but people can receive better sometimes from somebody who just connects with them, just like we did there at the uh, taking a moment and, and just being sensitive to the prompting of the Holy Spirit and, and saying, you know, it's one thing to, to have a time and an opportunity for people to respond for healing prayer. It's another thing to minister to it right then to where they can receive the healing to move into what God wants to speak to them and how God wants to minister to them. Does that make sense to everyone? All right, and so, so I want you to, to let God paint the picture in your heart, but then I want you to see your, yourself in the picture. Where, where does God put you? And of course, we can all be the ones in trouble or the ones who've been sick and the ones who needed prayer or received prayer, or the ones who needed forgiveness or needed to forgive. And we, we find ourselves in that as the object of it, but also the, the ones whom God calls to be the ministers of it. The, um, not all of us are elders in the, the uh, biblical definition of that, um, but we, we are, those who are mature in the Lord, I think, certainly qualify uh, in, what God, in the, the heart of what James is trying to communicate here. So, so I wanted to make that connection as we go through. Let's start in verse 13 again. Is any of you in trouble? He should pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Is any one of you sick? He should call for the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer that is offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. I just want to pause there for a moment and, and emphasize the fact that healing is much more than just physical. That, that the aspect of healing it comes into the spiritual realm. If he's sinned, he'll, he'll be forgiven. Um, the, uh, what's the old hymn say? The, God heals the sin-sick soul. And... Uh, not all sickness comes because of sin. Certainly not all sickness is uh, through... Uh, many times we, we think that, that God puts it on us as judgment for our sin. God doesn't use sickness to control us. God uses love to reach us and heal us and cause us to be whole so that we can walk in the fullness of that. Come on, somebody. But there is an aspect where sin opens us to to uh, living in the curse or opens our body to uh, deterioration faster than uh, the curse of sin that entered in uh, generations ago through Adam. And we, we live in a fallen world, but that's why we can be overcomers in Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. And so it's an awesome thing. And so the connection to that and to the power and to the healing is through prayer. And then he makes this statement at the end, the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Powerful and effective. He uses two big power words there. It's one thing to be powerful if, if uh, in the, the sense of one of the words for power, there's dunamis, which is where we get our English word dynamite. The explosive power, power to, to change things and affect that. But the other side he said, not only is it powerful in that way of coming in and, and making a dramatic difference, but it's effective. Effective is that sense of, of knowing uh, it's not just taking a, 
uh, to put it in a medical term, uh, there are a lot of medications that are powerful. They're strong. They have a, a powerful effect on the body or cells or whatever. But it's another thing to have the right medication for the, to, to target it at the right sickness or illness or whatever. Otherwise, it can have the reverse effect. Are you with me? So powerful is one thing. Effective is, is something else. Well, the prayer of a righteous man is both. Powerful and effective. It, it affects change immediately. It, it brings strength to weariness and weakness and that kind of thing. And now we've got this powerful force working, but it's not just power uh, or overpowering us, but it's also effective. That it's targeted at those specific areas to where if we're struggling with sin or if we're in trouble or, or if we're we're wrestling uh, not knowing what the the avenue is where sickness has come or weakness is there that that God takes care of the whole thing and says look when we come together to pray he releases a healing that is spirit soul and body that that works effectively in those ways but powerfully as well because many times we go to the wrong power source that we look to other things to meet those needs and it gets us into bondage. It gets us into error. We begin to believe lies that become truth and it gets us into areas of sin, uh, sometimes unintentionally. Um, it's why David would pray, Lord, not only the, the willful sins that I have committed, but even the ones I'm not aware of. The, 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 the secret sins as well as those that were just transgressions. I didn't set my heart on evil that, that this tripped me up. And so, Lord, would you take care of all of that? And God graciously meets him there. And to me, this is James Parallel talking about that. So you see how powerful it works in a body of believers. Then he gives the example of Elijah. And here's what I love. He just said the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. And so then he says, Elijah was a man just like us. And I think sometimes we have a tendency to put Bible characters not only up on a pedestal, but, you know, exalt them to, to uh, legendary status. You know, I love the line from uh, Sandlot, the movies, uh, the movie where the little guys are talking to one another and says, or they're talking to the uh, James Earl Jones, you know, the, the baseball legend and, and who has the, the baseball signed by the great Bambino and they don't know who that is or one of them doesn't anyway. And so they talk about, man, that guy was a hero. And so then he tells them, listen, kid, heroes get remembered, but legends never die. And so in that sense, we, we kind of like we have our Bible heroes and those that we exemplify, but we have to realize they weren't perfect either. And then the sense when we exalt them to legendary status, they become bigger than life. And so James, in not a condescending way, but brings it back down to where we live. And he says, the prayers of a righteous man are powerful and effective. And then he says, let me give you an example. Elijah. Not the legend Elijah, the man Elijah. He was a man just like us. Now, I don't know how many of us would put ourselves in the position of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with 800 false prophets um, that were crazy. That their worship was just nuts. And so they go through all of this weird uh, witchcraft stuff that they did, whipping themselves and cutting themselves and crying out and whatever. And Elijah's just there taunting them. And he said, Elijah was a man just like us. And it wasn't just in that avenue of facing the 800 false prophets. It was having faith enough to pray that it wouldn't rain on the land for, for until through prayer that God would dry it up and send drought as a, as a sign of judgment prophetically on the land. And for three and a half years, it didn't rain. And again, he prayed and God sent the rain and the earth produced its crops. Now, if you've ever lived in a uh, area where uh, farming or whatever is, is much more seasonal than it is here, uh, you know, it can get, we can go through seasons of drought here in South Mississippi, but not for very long. And, you know, the pine trees don't dry up and shrivel away. But it's one thing to, to 
go through a time of drought, three and a half years of drought, no rain whatsoever. And then when rains come again after those three and a half years, not only is there seed in the soil that's been there, but the soil is parched and it begins to crack. And sometimes those cracks can be inches deep, sometimes feet deep. And so the moisture drains out of it. And sometimes when the rains come, uh, after a, a, an extended season of drought, it, it's, again, this uh, extended period of destruction that it washes away much of the soil and the seed that was in it when, when the rains do come. So what I want you to see here is that it wasn't just a word of judgment that Elijah prayed. It was a prayer to God. And, and when he prayed the prayer, God just sort of put it on pause and he held back the rains for three and a half years. But when he did send the rains, God's heart is to release the life that is already there. There's life in the seed and there's seed time and there's harvest. And so when we go through that, here he's saying this powerful example of Elijah, a man just like us, praying a prayer in faith to God and the heavens are shut up for three and a half years. But again he prays and not only did the rains come, but the earth produced its crops. And so then he brings it back to that part that's powerful for us uh, of the example. And he says again, at the end of that, uh, that the earth produces crops. And then he brings it back to us. My brothers, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring him back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save him from death and cover over a multitude of sins. Right? He's, he's talking about how powerful God's healing love is. And he's talking about the, the expressions of that, but as it's, it's released in a body of believers in, in a culture uh, of prayer and faith and healing and life, not of judgment and criticism. He doesn't say if any of you is in trouble, uh, you should go hide out in the bar somewhere. And, and when you kind of get your life back together again, come and join the church people because they know you. Thank God he didn't say that. When you're in trouble, you need to go to people where you can find help and healing. And we need to be those people. Can, can I wait on a better amen other than from Neil who lives that out? Come on, somebody. You know, but the tendency is to what? Do what Adam did. And get afraid and let fear drive us and hide from God rather than come to God to be healed by him. And we still do that because the enemy still works in our lives in that way. But listen, when we can change that around and realize not only the power of prayer, but the love of our God that is so wide, so wide, is any of you in trouble? Let him pray. And God's right there to help. But then he brings it into community and he says, is anybody happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Where do we do that? You can do that in your heart. You can do that like Chris described uh, today. God just put a song on his heart and, you know, he just let it fly. And, uh, you know, he just sings loud and strong. And he's been really working to try to get on the platform and, and lead us in worship. And, you know, I said, joyful noise still qualifies. And so, you know, we, we may, we may let, just release that. He's giving me the no sign. Cut it off right there, Pastor. Don't, don't put that on me. I just feel an anointing coming on my life right now. I just want to speak a word over your life, Chris. <laughs> you don't want to receive the word of the Lord. There you go. Oh. It must have been the trouble part. Are, are you the one in trouble? Oh, man, I just, I got it backwards. I'm sorry. <laughs> Amen. Don't we all? All right, so we're in trouble. Uh, uh, let's pray. Uh, are, are we happy? Let's sing songs of joy. It says, is any of you sick? That's not specific categories. It, it's the effect of how it works in our life and how sin works in our life, how sickness works in our life, how life works in our life. And so he says, here when it comes to this aspect of sickness, not only call for the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. It's an anointed prayer. Uh, symbolically, anointing of oil was simply to, to take oil, which was a symbol of the Holy Spirit, and put it on someone's head or apply it uh, to their, their forehead, or uh, many times they would anoint the part of the body that, where they needed uh, healing. 
If it was an injury or, or a, a sickness, whatever. But it's a sign of the Holy Spirit coming upon them. So it wasn't just people that had a, a, a strong prayer life or uh, uh, those with a gift of uh, healing. It, it's always plural when Paul defines it in 1 Corinthians 12. Uh, all the others are single, but when it comes to the healing gift, it's gifts of healings. So it's a, it's a double plural. And so there's, there's lots of ways, in other words, for us to be healed. And uh, God, but they're all anointed and they're all given by the Holy Spirit to what? Uh, heal people, to touch their lives. And so he defines that then a little more specific and says that, that the prayer of... Uh, uh, anointed prayer in the name of the Lord offered in faith will make the sick person well and the Lord will raise him up. So it's not just that he's healed or the fever breaks or the sickness is gone or God takes it from him, but God strengthens him and raises him up. How many of you have ever gone through a period of sickness more than a day or so or just, you know, flu or whatever it is? And it's not just the fact that that you endure it or you make it through or that you get healed or that, that the, the sickness breaks, but then you got to get your strength back. You know, and you get down uh, in, in a way we actually use that term. You know, man, I got the, the flu and then I got down in my back. Or, you know, I just didn't have enough strength to, to, to get back up and do that. And so here he says, not only is it healing specifically for the sickness, uh, any of you sick, uh, which could be, again, this wide spectrum. But he said, not only does anointed prayer uh, in, the, in the power of the Holy Spirit in the name of the Lord make the sick person well, but God raises him up. It also makes that sick person strong. And it's an immediate thing of God lifting them and raising them up. Sometimes it's the emotional impact of that. Many times people go through extended illnesses the, the thing they struggle with is uh, uh, at, attitudes or uh, uh, they struggle with depression because of the disconnection from life-giving people. And they just feel cut off and, and that kind of deal. So now it's, you know, we're, again, the enemy, his plan of oppression, and God not only wants to break the oppression and heal all manner of sickness and disease, but he wants to lift those people up. And it's people struggling with depression and people wrestling with that whole sense of disconnection and, and people not being there to support them or uh, them feeling like they've been let down. Come on now. And he says here, God will lift them up. God lifts them up. And as we do, then it's this embrace of, and if they've sinned, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. And again, he, he takes the wide love and the long love of God, and, and now he, he takes it a little bit deeper because that, that gets a little more touchy, doesn't it? Uh, therefore, confess your sins to each other. He's not talking in the Catholic sense of being absolved. He's talking about coming and saying, listen, not just the sins, but the struggles. I think when he starts with, is any of you in trouble? It's a whole lot easier to come to somebody in an atmosphere of healing and love and prayer and a, and a culture of faith and encouragement and confidence in God and to say, man, would you guys pray for me? I'm struggling in this area. I'm really wrestling with this. And then put yourself in a position to receive not just those prayers, but to receive the power and the effectiveness, the effective power that come with them to receive what the Holy Spirit has for you, to receive the healing that Jesus came to give you. I love Acts chapter 10, verse 38, uh, that describes Jesus. And it says, how God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and power, and He went about doing good, healing all who were under the power of the enemy. All right, And so, if Jesus had that example and said to us, I'll build a church that the gates of hell can't prevail against, and you will not only do what I've done, but greater things than these, because I go to the Father. And when He went to the Father, He didn't leave us comfortless, He sent us a comforter. 
and, and the, the Holy Spirit came upon those at the day of Pentecost and uh, was a, a key part of the church to, to lead them forward in power and might. And it needs to be a key part of the church and of our lives today. Come together and, and great grace was upon them all and powerful miracles were done. And so when we cry out, where are those things? Well, they're right there in those seats. And when we activate them through prayer, when we activate them through connecting with the Holy Spirit and realizing that, that putting oil on someone's uh, head doesn't heal them, whether they're essential oils or whatever. Hallelujah. We, we got some of those. Kim took some essential oils the other night and peppermint and whatever it was and, and put them on her tongue and then she came to kiss me goodnight. Not only was it a sweet smelling sacrifice to the Lord, it was overwhelming. I'm like, huh, uh, knee. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't ever want to turn down a kiss, but man, that one was a little, it was powerful and effective. Come on, somebody. It's like, woof, all righty. And that might be TMI, but hey, I'm trying to build a culture of love. It starts at home, baby. It starts at home. <laughs> so, so he says th th that we're to, to activate that and manifest that uh, anointing and to connect it with the Lord. It's not the, the, the prayers that raise the sick person up. The Lord raises him up. Come on, are you seeing that? And, and what an awesome thing to be able to work with God like that. And to cooperate with what the Spirit of the Lord wants to do through us. To stay humble. To, to walk in love. To, to realize that when we see people, they, they're not targets. They're, they're not opportunities for us to do our ministry, whatever that is, but they're valuable to God. And no matter what places are broken and what trouble they find themselves in and what sicknesses have invaded their life and what choices that they've made to open themselves up to the enemy's plan to kill, steal, and destroy, we serve a God who is the healer. And His Father anointed Him with the Holy Spirit and power, and He just went about doing good. Man, if we'd set our hearts on that, you know, we, we kind of downplay that in our society. We have a term called a do-gooder. I mean, he's just a do-gooder. Well, we all need to be do-gooders. We all need to go around doing good like Jesus. Listen, they criticized him, they mocked him, and oh, by the way, they killed him. And just to make sure, they stuck a spear in his side and blood and water flowed. And what we need to do is access those same things. The life of God that's in his blood and the water that cleanses us, the washing with water through His Word. And we need to take the, the, the blood by faith, and, and we need to be, uh, uh, instead of worrying about walking on water, uh, we need to walk with water. And we need to uh, offer it to people as, you know, those cleansing words and, and, and manifest that in our midst. The last thing that I want to just encourage us with is, is the last part of where He said... Uh, uh, about if my brothers, if one of you should, should wander from the truth and someone should turn him back, remember this. Mark this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will not only save his soul from death, but he'll cover over a multitude of sins. I was really blessed Sunday morning. Um, Cretia uh, was a first-time visitor and came up after service and, and uh, introduced herself and I think I'm saying her name right, and uh, just kind of shared with me a part of her story. Uh, actually, Miss Vicky came with her, and so Miss Vicky shared most of the story, and then we were kind of waiting to, to connect. If you all know Miss Vicky, you know what I'm talking about. And, but it was sweet. And so just that point of connection, and she, this particular uh, part where I just referenced it Sunday morning in the message, and she said, that so ministered to me because she's got a family member that's not walking with the Lord. And so she's really concerned and burdened. And she said, you know how you, you pray, but then it's like, man, you get discouraged and nothing happens and they're resistant. And, and she said, but I was so encouraged with that, that not only am, is it about him coming to know the Lord, but it's through being faithful in prayer and the encouragement of that, that we're covering sins they, they've yet to commit. We're covering this whole uh, area here that they haven't walked in yet. And, and the prayer that's powerful and effective can not only turn them from the error of the way, it turns them back 
into a place of healing and forgiveness and grace and strength. And how many people would love to be a part of a place like that? Five of us. Well, that's great. Jesus started with 12. We'll, we'll start with that. Amen? Hallelujah. So, so I want us just to, to activate that tonight for a while. Can we do that? We, we've got plenty of time here uh, before we go. And so here's what I'd like for us to do. Uh, first of all, just to embrace that tonight. And I want you to take a minute. And uh, I'm sorry, Greg, I meant to uh, hand you my phone. There's a song I want us to do. Can you do that? You remember all the stuff? You need my access code and everything? <laughs> oh, yeah, I thought I was going there. No. Uh, it's a song on the, the first one on that prayer list called Arms Wide Open. Uh, I don't know if you, how many of you are familiar. There's a worship leader named Misty Edwards and uh, sang this song called Arms Wide Open. And it's kind of one of those deals like Chris was talking about where uh, it's a powerful song, but the, she asked the question in the song, what does love look like? And so it's this, this expression, and that phrase was just on my heart all week. What does love look like? And obviously we're doing this series called So Loved, and love looks a lot like uh, a, a beaten man on a cross, uh, pouring at his heart, taking care of his mother, uh, praying to his father, praying to the ones that are being crucified with him, um, releasing forgiveness. Love looks a lot like that. But, but love looks a lot like you. And love sometimes looks like me, believe it or not. Love look, lo looks a lot like your kids. Love sometimes is just simple little expressions, but sometimes it's powerful. You know, love looks like some brothers coming alongside uh, a man who's fallen. Love looks like uh, a bunch of workers showing up with their jeans and work gloves and raking some leaves and mowing a yard. Love looks like those that just come to serve on a Sunday morning to prepare a place for people to come and hear and receive. Love looks like a smile. Sometimes love goes liquid and it's released down your faces. Um, there's a powerful scene at the end of the movie Dances with Wolves. And uh, some of you might not have connected with that, but it's, that's where I'm from. It was filmed about 60 miles from my house. And the Lakota Sioux uh, tribe is in that area, and there's a reservation that's there. And so have a real heart for uh, First Nations people, particularly in that area. And the, the story is of Lieutenant uh, John Dunbar, who was fighting in the Civil War and then just kind of gets jaded with the whole thing and, and goes out on the prairie and they station him in this incredibly remote area out in South Dakota and every other person has abandoned the post and goes through this whole thing. It's a long movie, but it's a good movie. And the last scene kills me every time. And he befriends this tribe of Lakota Sioux and, uh, of course, there's great animosity there. And it shows this beautiful picture of these people who live in community, incredibly so, and, and how they take care of it. In fact, he falls in love with one of the uh, women there in the tribe who was actually uh, taken from her family and, and become part of the tribe. And, but their custom is that they have to, to, uh, pay, uh, they have to buy the wife, if you will. And they have to offer something, and he doesn't have anything. Of value. And so the, the entire tribe, every one of them come and bring things to him. Give something to him of theirs so that he can have enough to purchase his wife. Now, I know that's kind of antiquated stuff and, you know, we've all been liberated and all that kind of thing. I'm not saying that we're going to go back to that. Although, as a parent of three daughters, I do believe in arranged marriages. We're going to start preaching that doctrine. But so, so, so long story short here, uh, not only does he befriend them, but actually becomes part of the tribe. And, and they receive him in. And, and it's just powerful thing about love being stronger than hatred and fear and all of that. And so they teach him a lot. And he learns a lot from them. And at the end, he realizes that 
that not only are the soldiers going to come for him, but they're also going to come to kill the tribe. And so he makes a decision that he needs to leave for their benefit. And so they're arguing with him, and it's this really intense thing. And so he takes his wife, and, and they're journeying off. And it's this place in the Badlands in South Dakota that's just beautiful. And um, one of the warriors that's uh, one of the fierce guys, I don't know, it's an emotional deal for me, but this old home moment, just give me a time. Uh, w- one of the warriors that h- it was so uh, adamant against him initially, now they formed this bond, brothers. And his name is Wind in His Hair. And... Um, they named Lieutenant John Dunbar Dances with Wolves because he had a wolf and they saw him out on the prairie dancing with him. And so in the, their dialect, those names are very significant. But in God's dialect, so is yours. But here's what I want you to get. So, so the final scene, they're going off and it's sad and it's heart-wrenching. And then what you hear is wind in his hair high up on this cliff. And he's holding up this spear. And at the top of his lungs, he's yelling. And he's saying, dances with wolves. I am wind in his hair. Do you hear me? Dances with wolves. I, my name is wind in his hair and I am your friend. Do you hear me? Dances with wolves. I am wind in his hair and I am your friend and I will always be your friend. Do you hear me? And he keeps repeating it over and over and over. And as they're walking through this valley on their horses, snow-covered places, all you hear is this echo through the valley. Dances with wolves. I am wind in his hair. I am your friend. I will always be your friend. For life, I am your friend. Do you hear me? There was a great warrior who came and lived among us and became part of our tribe so that we could be adopted into his. His name was the Lion of Judah. That was his tribal name. His tribe was Judah. And and he said that to those closest to him. Do you hear me? You are my friends. I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know anything about his master's business. Now love one another even as I have loved you. And I will always be your friend. And I will never leave you. Do you hear me? What does love look like? To me it looks a lot like that. Would you bow your heads with me tonight? Thank you, guys. Amen. You have that ready? This, this song's kind of long here, but I just want you to take some time and first just focus on that. Um, and listen to the question, what does love look like? Let me call you back to where we started. What's the picture that God painted in your heart, in your mind tonight as we went through this? What, what, what stuck? What connected? That's an indicator of how God wants to use you and how... He wants to release an anointing through your life, a power through your life. And sometimes we struggle with being worthy or uh, knowing what to say or whatever. Listen, if it's prompted by love, it it can't be wrong. If it's prompted in the Word and there's a, a washing that's there that God wants to use us. And sometimes He breaks our hearts with the, the things that are breaking other people's hearts so that we can connect. It's called compassion. Other times, He, he draws on our strength when, when they're weak. Other times, it's that release in our heart of just mercy, of realizing, man, that I was there. Listen, I can identify. I know what you're talking about. I know what you're feeling. Sometimes it's just a burden that He puts in our heart, in our life. To, to prompt us to, to release that aspect of healing, whatever it might be. We forgive because we've been forgiven. Jesus said, the one that's forgiven much, loves much. 
And so I want us to think about that tonight here for a few minutes and then we'll, we'll connect with others in prayer. But I really want to just apply it to our hearts and lives here for a minute and just let God work that in our spirit. Amen? What, what does love look like? And I want you to get the impression in your heart. 